<laughs> Don't applaud, you haven't heard this yet. No. Oops, it's just for coffee? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today and I want to thank Mark for inviting me to, uh, to start off the, uh, the lecture series uh, this semester. Um, I was listening to both radio stations, actually uh, WUTK and WUOT this weekend, I was driving around uh, uh, the, 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 the campus in my car. It's a little disconcerting to hear your name on the radio when you're not expecting it. Uh, but what was even more disconcerting was that the title that was being announced was The Future of Energy from Crops. And I heard that and I thought, oh my goodness, that's impossibly large. Um, and I, I, so, you know, I don't want to get the expectations too high that I'm going to try and cover an entire topic like that. Yeah. And for that matter, I've gone ahead and given you a subtitle, uh, whether or not the biorefinery can, can survive cheap oil. That's still pretty unmanageable. We'll, we'll see what we can do with it. Uh, what I'd like to do today, then, is really talk about the interplay between petrochemical refining and biorefining, the use of renewable feedstocks, agricultural materials, forestry materials, and how that interacts with petrochemical refining, because they're closely related and they do affect one another. So what I'll do today, I'm going to give a little background, some overview of the areas, tell a few stories, and I hope I uh, present enough information that we can spark some of the, some interesting discussion at the end, because I understand in the forum that's, that's part of the, uh, the, the wrap up of this. There'll be some time at the end for questions and, and chat. Uh, okay, so to start out, if we're going to talk about interplay, um, it's important to note that there's always been this love-hate relationship between petrochemical refining and biorefining. Um, the, bi the petrochemical refinery is the principal competitor of biorefining, but at the same time it's the best model for biorefining because it has 150 years of experience in learning how to take a raw material from the ground, convert it, refine it, transport it, and make it into a wide range of chemicals and fuels. So it's a great, way, it's a great thing for the biorefining industry to think about. Uh, Petrochemical industry has been around, like I said, for 150 years. Um, the, the materials that you use, bitumen and tar, think about, think asphalt, occurs in natural formations in various places around the world. Uh, things like oil seeps. Um, there are places in the world where oil just naturally bubbles to the surface and people were skimming it off and using it for medicinal purposes primarily, or sealing boats, or, or patching things up. But the petrochemical industry itself really got its start in the uh, kind of the mid middle part of the uh, 19th century. And the primary interest at that time was illumination. People needed fuel for lamps. Um, and at that time you, had, you basically had two choices. You had whale oil and you had camphene. Camphene is a derivative of terpene, or of turpentine, and the, it, they worked. They gave light. But the, the issue was that whale oil is expensive and, and camphene tended to explode. And so in a household situation, that was not ideal. What was found was that uh, this gentleman, Abraham Gerstner, a Canadian, found that if you could, take, you could take the asphalt, some of this naturally occurring asphalt, and remove from it a material that he named uh, kerosene, which comes from Greek keros, meaning wax, and eleon, meaning oil. And he changed the second syllable to ene, so his commercial product would sound like camphene kerosene and would put the idea in people's mind that it was a fuel. And it worked pretty well. He was pretty successful in the 1800s setting up these kerosene producing plants that, uh, that were used for illumination. Well, at about the same time, George Bissell, an entrepreneur from the Northeast, he'd been all over the United States, was, knew about oil deposits in Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania. And he, he also knew they were flammable. And he thought that might be a better source of kerosene than the, uh, than the tar sources that, that, Gess, that uh, uh, Gersner, Gessner was using. Um, so he paired up with Benjamin Silliman, who was a, a famous Yale chemist at the time, and they wanted to prove this principle. So they got uh, some of the material from these oil seeps, which at the time was called rock oil, and very quickly got translated into Latin, Petra for rock, Oleum for oil, petroleum. So that's where the term comes from. Um, and so they found they took this petroleum. Um, Sim, uh, Bissell gave some of it to Silliman. Silliman went into his laboratories and found out if you heated up the material from these oil seeps, yes, indeed, you got more kerosene, you got it more efficiently, and you suddenly had a new supply 
of illuminant that was going to be cheaper than what Gessner was using. Only one problem. The oil that bubbled up from the ground, the technology to get there was not particularly sophisticated in that people would usually try skimming it off the top of the sources. Or you had people with rags and blankets soaking it up and you take them over somewhere and you wring all the oil out. Not particularly a commercially viable way to do it. Bissell's technological idea, which at the time was called a lunatic idea, was to drill for oil. No one had thought about that before. Drill for oil and pump it up from the ground the same way you pump water from the ground. So to that end, he hired this guy, Edwin Drake. And Edwin Drake was familiar with the area where the, these oil seeps were in rural Pennsylvania. Bissell gave him the title of Colonel Edwin Drake because he felt that that title would actually endear him to the locals that were up in that part. So Colonel Edwin Drake went to Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, spent several very fruitless months trying to get this drilling process to work. April 27th, 1859, he's working on his drill. It's at 69 feet. It drops into a crevasse and then drops another six inches and he gives up for the day. When they came back and looked at the well the next day, floating on the top of the well was oil. Uh, Drake went in, took a hand pump, a simple hand pump you'd use for water, started pumping and they were pumping out as much oil as they could possibly transport. It worked. The principle was proven. And then suddenly the oil rush was on. We had the start of the petrochemical industry. And the rest of these dates in here are very indicative of what happened at that time. After Titusville, Pennsylvania, the Rockefellers found oil kind of in the Midwest. The spindle top field, some of you may have heard that in Texas. That's the one where you think of, where you see gushers. There was so much, that stuff would go blowing out of the, of the ground at that point. Uh, California, Oklahoma, and then more recently, I'll talk about this, shale oil. Um, fracking, um, unconventional sources of oil. It also happened internationally, uh, in the, again in the mid-19th century. One of the biggest discoveries was Russia and the Baku oil fields. They're still operating today and in fact you can go to Azerbaijan and go, into, go to spas where you can get petroleum mud baths because they feel they have um, um, medicinal qualities. And then, for better or for worse, the United States, they found oil in the Middle East. We're still working with that today, working through that today. Uh, Alberta has their oil sands that they're currently commercializing and operating with. Okay, that's, so that's, that's just a very quick sketch. I do want to point out one thing here too, that once an industry is established and starts generating profits, technology always becomes a part of it to help improve. Yes? The, oh. the dollar figures you had. Yes. Uh, $20 a barrel was the original Cost. I forget. You, thank you for pointing that out. And I think that's in 19th century dollars. The issue, what the, the point of this is that when it started out, $20 a barrel. As the process got better and better, 10 cents a barrel for a while. <laughs> so you can see, it's a very, very good uh, demonstration of supply and demand. And it was still commercially viable at 10 cents a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, there were, there's all sorts of things that get involved in the economics of this. Um, Ma'am? Robin, there's a... Okay. okay. Yeah, there, there's all sorts of things that get involved in the economics of this as to whether it's viable or not. But at the time, even at 10 cents a barrel, they kept pumping it because they saw opportunity. Because, and, and as you know, the price went, has gone up and down with time. But as far as technological developments are concerned, a lot of technology followed this industry because it became so, so impressive. I only want to give one example here because I kind of like the story. One of the issues with getting kerosene out of oil was that it was what's called a batch process. You made a bunch of kerosene and that process generated in the reactors something called coke. It just plugged the reactors terribly and it required you shut down your reactor, send three or four guys in with hammers and picks and clean it all out not economically viable at all. This family, the Dubs family, this is Jesse Dubs, this is his son C.P. Dubs. They came up with a process to make this kerosene production continuous. A very big improvement in the industry and it made the ability to get this illuminant, this fuel, out even more efficiently than they could in the past. The Dubs process really set the, uh, really helped move the petrochemical industry along and as I'll talk about, it formed the basis of the ability to start making chemicals along with fuel from biomass. 
And part of the story I like is that CP was named by his dad. The C stands for carbon. That's how obsessively interested they were in, 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 in petrochemicals. The P, petroleum. I kid you not, you are looking at a picture of carbon petroleum doves. Um, he, and he became incredibly wealthy. He founded, uh, if you've heard of the company UOP, Universal Oil Products. They're still an operating company in the United States. And he became rich as a, base, as a result of this process. If there are any organic chemists here, if we take the story to its end, he had two daughters. He named them Methyl and Ethel. <laughs> Swear to God. Okay, uh, this chemical production though, along with fuel, is very important to the petrochemical industry. And this, uh, this slide gives you a cartoon as to why that's the case. What do they do with their raw material right now? You take your carbon source, right now you hear crude oil, and more than 90% of that is used for what's called energy extraction. You refine it and you get hydrocarbons out of it and you subject it to a freshman chemistry reaction. You just treat it with oxygen, you burn it. And when you burn these hydrocarbons, you get carbon dioxide, you get water and energy. And we use that in our buildings, we use that in our cars, we use that in industry all the time. Huge amount of the petrochemicals we use go to energy. The other 10% though, I would argue, is almost the more important part. Because this is the chemical production. From these carbon sources, the petrochemical industry has learned how to make a group of very simple, structurally simple materials. You get these materials here called aromatics, benzene, toluene, and xylene, BTX. You get olefins, ethylene, propylene, butylene. If you're doing uh, um, syngas formation, if, you, if you're using coal, you can make a material called syngas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And you've got methane from natural gas. From that very, very simple group of starting materials, the technology has been developed to make thousands and thousands of organic chemicals, materials, plastics, you name it. Everything that, you're in, that you are touching in here that is not an inorganic material, it's an organic material, comes from those guys. Amazing, amazing amount of technology that gets, that gets uh, used in this. The 10% or less of the chemical production generates at least 50 to 60% of the profits of the industry. And it's this package, the simultaneous production of energy and chemicals, that makes the petrochemical industry possible. And I'll be coming back to that in a little bit. But don't get the idea that the biorefinery is just something from the late 20th century. Even in the 1930s, there was interest in using alternative sources of carbon because um, it was recognized almost from the start that pumping this stuff from the ground was a non-sustainable, non-renewable way to do things um, and that other sources might be necessary. Um, the, the, the renewables, the biorefinery concept can go back to the 1930s and industrialists that were working in something called the Kemergy movement. Anything that you can grow in agriculture can be used to make, uh, or anything you can make from petrochemicals you can make from agriculture. And that included folks like uh, George Washington Carver, William J. Hale. You know who this is? It's Henry Ford. Henry Ford was a big proponent of renewables. And this is one of, <laughs> it's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is Henry Ford. This is a 1941 Ford product. And this is Henry Ford. It's hard to see in here. I think it's probably because of the brown wall. He's got an ax. And he's taking an ax to the back of his truck, or the back of his 41 Ford, because he's taken this material and made it out of a soy-based composite material. And he wanted to prove that it, it was just as good as steel. And this, was, this is a test he did on regular basis, on regular basis to, was to show that renewables could be used in commercial products. Uh, so we had this in the 1930s. In the 1970s and 1980s, we had more interest in renewables as a result of oil crises and, and, and perceived oil shortages. And every time we've seen renewables come up, uh, uh, the interest in renewables come up, we see very similar arguments. This is from 1930, foreign, the, the concept of foreign oil is a problem. We've got to have our own domestic supplies. At the same time, if you're going to use ethanol, ethanol is never going to work as well as gasoline. These old arguments still sound very contemporary. So renewables also have some, has some early, uh, early successes as well. Uh, World War I was a, very, was, was a very good example, World War I in Britain. 
in that at that time, this is 19, 1915, Britain had a shortage of acetone. Acetone was a key component in making cordite, which is a key component of smokeless powder. And Britain needed a whole lot of cordite in order to keep lobbing artillery shells at the Germans in Europe. Well, the acetone originally came from Germany. That wasn't going to work anymore. And so they needed a new source. C.P. Scott, publisher of the Manchester Guardian, knew David Lloyd George, who was the munitions minister in England at that time. They got to talking about the acetone shortage. And C.P. Scott knew this guy, Heim Weizmann, who was a biochemist at Manchester University. <coughs> in 1912, Weizmann had come up with an organism, Clostridium acetobutylicum, that was able to take renewable material and convert it into a mixture of acetone, butanol, and ethanol, ratio of about 6 to 3 to 1. In 1912, nobody figured this was worth anything. In 1915, David Lloyd George said, we got to make a lot of this stuff. And so he supported uh, Weizmann's effort to do a lot to scale up this industry and make acetone from renewable feedstocks. There's some great stories about how um, children in, in, in Britain were encouraged to gather horse chestnuts and turn those in as part of their war effort because the horse chestnuts contain sugars that could make acetone, that could make cordite, that could make bombs. I don't know, what great story. I don't know if it's a great story or not, but it's, it's interesting. At the end of the war, there, there's some of the sources that are, you can read on this uh, thinks that uh, Weizmann's efforts actually saved Britain in World War I. At the end of this, David Lloyd George, who was now Prime Minister of England, was so happy he wanted re to, uh, uh, to reward Weizmann for his efforts. Weizmann said, personally, I don't want any rewards, but I'm really interested in a Jewish homeland. Britain had, at that, as a result of World War I, had taken control of the Palestine area. And so you, carry, you follow the, the dots through. Lloyd began talking to Arthur Balfour, who was the Foreign Minister of England. And the result was the Balfour Declaration uh, in 1917 saying that Britain supported a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. 1948, Israel was established by the United Nations. First Prime Minister, Heim Weizmann. Okay. Another, I just love another, these kind of stories. OK, but I think that one of the things that starts coming out that I've seen often is that when you think about renewables in a biorefining sense, it's always in response to a crisis. And the crisis was, is the perceived loss of a strategic raw material. If you lose that material, your economy might suffer, your, your society might change, whatever. And there's been a lot of efforts to try and quantitate how quickly oil is running out. Probably one of the best known ones is, is what's called Hubbard's Curve, uh, generated in the mid-50s by M. King Hubbard. He was a petrochemist at, um, at Shell Oil at that time. And he made a prediction based on several assumptions, how much we're producing, technology development, known reserves, that sort of thing, and plotted a curve. And I, I always have a trouble finding this. There's a black one right here. This black curve predict was uh, um, uh, Hubbard's prediction of when oil production in the US would peak. In 1956, he predicted about 1970, and that was a home run. He hit it right on, because at that point, oil production started dropping as we, as we approach 2000. Other people in the world now have extended his results and applied it to uh, oil production worldwide. And you've probably heard the term peak oil. You hear that in the popular media frequently. Peak oil was, you, you never know it till you pass it. Yeah. But one of the things that was uh, around 2000, 2005 is, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit too, was generally thought at the time that the world's hit peak oil. We'll see. Um, but the fact that Hubbard was able to do this was actually pretty amazing. Now, I do want to point out that Hubbard's technology has, uh, and his methodology has been applied in other areas as well. I'm particularly fond of this one. Um, <laughs> oil production, Rolling Stone's top 500 songs. <laughs> Some of you from a certain era in this room may actually find these ev this evidence compelling. Because, uh, so. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, well, I know, the, the source that I got it from, overthinking.com. Yeah. <laughs> so. so how much of the, in the, the peak stuff and whatnot in terms of exploration, how much of that is in 
terms of the actual reserve versus political decisions about whether to explore, to allow exploration or not, like in the Gulf and so forth? I, the, the numbers that you see here on something like Hubbard's curve, this is based on known reserves everywhere. This is 2000. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and I'm, and I'm going to get, and actually you're going to, I'm, I'm tipping the story here a little bit, but you're going to see a change in this a little bit as we, okay. as we get into this. Okay. So, how, every time we have a crisis, people start turning to biorefining and renewables. And the justification for that is actually, it, it's, it's, it's actually quite dogmatic. Uh, I've got these li this list of, po of, of, of justifications up here. That's after about a 10 minute search in the literature. You see these kind of things all the time. The United States is faced with constantly increasing imports. We're not getting enough discoveries. Crude oil is going away. The raw material costs are going up. The people we import from don't like us very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we're always using more energy. And we've got greenhouse gas emission issues. So I've, and then, you know, I've got all of these. I've used them in, in, in proposals frequently because they're, they're you know, yeah, yeah. It, it, it supports what I want to do. So, uh, and the result of that is that is the biorefinery. The, con the biorefinery is no longer a concept. It's a real thing. And I use this slide up here just to, 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 to define a couple of terms that are, that are important in the industry. One of them is renewable carbon. We've talked about that a little bit already. Um, because the products, the raw materials of the petrochemical industry and the biorefining industry uh, are primarily based on carbon, you have non-renewable sources of carbon and renewable sources of carbon. We're in the center for renewable carbon and work on those issues. The biomass that we use, the principal, the, the material that's of most interest now is, a, is the non-food sources of renewable carbon. Things you don't have to worry about food versus fuel kinds of arguments. Uh, it's a material called lignocellulose, and I'll give you a little more information on that just in a little bit. Lignocellulose, you know, think wood, think agricultural residues, stuff you can grow but things you don't eat. Um, and these are traditionally been used for as building materials. You know, you make lumber, you build, you build houses out of it. But now it's been recognized that these materials also can serve as sources of fuels and chemicals and not be food-based. So what's inside of lignocellulosic? In the same way that Gessner and Silliman found that you could get kerosene out of crude oil, there are simpler pieces and parts inside of, of lignocellulosic biomass. This is as complicated as the chemistry is going to get today, I promise. But inside lignocellulose, I mean, the term is actually pretty self-descriptive. You have cellulose, which is a long chain of glucose molecules strung together. You have lignin, which is this horribly complex uh, uh, poly polymeric material. And you have a material called hemicellulose. Now, I've put, in, put some descriptors in here. Because one way to think about lignocellulose, you know, how come a tree can, that's a 300-foot sequoia can stand up by itself? Well, it's because you have long chains, straight chains of cellulose acting as rebar, like in cement. You have cement surrounding the rebar, which is the lignin. And you have polymerization, you have uh, um, um, cement additives, which actually make the process a little bit better. These all three things together make the lignocellulosic matrix in biomass. And then the separation of biomass gives us access to each of these that we can use for chemicals and fuels. Is there a lot of it around? Yeah, depending on what you're using it for. If you're using it for fuel, the argument's a little more iffy. But if you're using it for chemicals, yes, we got a ton of it. Now the numbers here, they, they are going to say, frequently they'll say about the same thing in different ways. But photosynthesis, Earth uh, all over the world or, um, every year, you probably get 300 billion tons of biomass made. In the wood industry, you might get 100 million tons of wood annually. Within that, nature might make 90 billion pounds of cellulose. Corn, we generate 8 to 10 billion bushels of corn, each of which has starch in it. So there's all sorts of different ways to look at this. And we have the, the point of this slide is to show that we do have access to a large amount of raw material that if we learn how to transform it, we can have a chance of making a large number of renewable chemicals and fuels. If you want something to look at, if you have uh, Oak Ridge, just down the road, has been um, the primary author on something called the, uh, the Billion Ton Report. It gives you information on how much material is actually available 
and the current, <coughs> the, the, the current number is that uh, the United States can generate, if the proper infrastructure is in place, something like 1.3 billion tons of agricultural residues, lignocellulosic residues that can be used for chemicals and fuels on an annual basis. Outcome of all this, as I said, the biorefinery is, commercially, is, is a commercial reality. There are now several industrial uh, concerns that are making ethanol, making fuel from lignocellulose. Iowa, Kansas, um, Brazil, and, and Brazil. This is a picture of the Brazil facility. Um, what you figure, Iowa and Kansas, a lot of corn out there. Um, but there are, this is a commercial reality now because people are finding ways to make these transformations possible and they're finding ways to make them economically viable. We'll note one thing, Ab and Goa, no longer around. They've all been sold. Their technology got sold to DuPont and just recently all of their capital facilities in Kansas got sold to, uh, um, I think, a venture capitalist group of some kind. Reason for that is if we're going to go back to talking about interplay between petrochemicals and biorefining, nobody in the world saw this happening. Mid-2013, this is the price of oil over the last several years. Nobody saw this happening. We're very happy along here. $100, $100 a barrel, $110 a barrel. About 2014, the price just drops off the edge. It got as low as, I think that's about $29 a barrel. You, you probably remember reading about this in, in, the, in the media. The price has just plummeted. And this is fracking. That's what happened right there. That's, it, and it dropped the price off. Now I've got, the, these dates on here are because I've used this, I was using this slide over you know, a number of presentations over time. Every time I'd give the presentation, I'd think, okay, we've hit bottom right there. No, we didn't hit bottom. No, we didn't hit bottom. And now eventually, from this very low $29 a barrel, we've now sort of been hovering around $45 to $50 a barrel for several months. Maybe it's found its level right now. But that has a huge impact on biorefining. And remember Hubbard's curve that I talked about. Hubbard's curve suddenly got thrown out the window. This is oil and gas. Hubbard's curve is in red. Here's what's happening with oil and gas. It's going, it, it's, it's jumping back up as a result. That's worldwide or domestic? That's domestic. United States has become one of the top producers of oil and gas in the world. Nobody expected that either. Fracking is what's called a, a disruptive technology. Disrupt, it's kind of a buzzword, an industrial buzzword, but you know, what you think about fracking from an environmental and societal standpoint is something that should have as, as another science forum discussion. Mm -hmm. From an engineering standpoint, it's pretty fascinating uh, because a number of techno technology developments, the Dubs had technology developments that improved the petrochemical industry. Fracking is a new set, a new family of technological developments. Uh, you've got, for example, hydraulic fracturing. Every, everyone should have, probably has an idea of that, where you pump a liquid into a well. It cracks the rock and allows oil to come out that you couldn't get to before. The more interesting technology is actually this horizontal drilling. The fact that you can take a, well, a, a drill, head, drill head, run it down thousands and thousands of feet. By the way, it's a little hard to see here. That's the, the Empire State Building. And you can see how many Empire State Buildings deep you go. But you run it down thousands and thousands of feet and the drill head can actually turn. And you can go, and you end up going horizontally through an oil-rich source. You fracture it, and because you're going horizontally now, you can get access to much more oil from a single well than you could by just drilling vertically. If you just drill vertically, you can only get right, right there what, what the vertical drill shaft is able to, um, uh, to accommodate. You go horizontally, this kind of, this gives a picture of multiple um, uh, extraction points from single wells. How much is there of this? This is called, you know, the, the, this material, shale oil. I, I want to point out one thing that you might read in the, in the media. This is shale oil. It's not the same as oil shale. You, all, you may at some point read about oil shale in uh, the Green River Formation in Wyoming. Oil shale is something else. That's a rock. 
that you actually had to do completely different transformations on to get oil out of it. We got a lot of oil shale, but it's really expensive to use. Shale oil is the material you get from fracking. How much is there? Lots of it. All of these colored areas are areas where shale oil is either being extracted or can be extracted. The ones that are most familiar right now, the Bakken oil formation up in North Dakota, uh, the Permian Basin in Texas, Eagle Ford. There's even a little in what's called the Chattanooga Shale here in eastern Tennessee. In fact, 2007, they wanted to start drilling uh, up on the plateau. And there was, you know, there was a little uproar from the public, but what really stopped it was economics. It wasn't economical enough yet to start drilling up there. But mo very recently, there have been people buying up more and more land and more and more leases in that area. So there may very possibly be uh, natural gas drilling and fracking uh, up on the plateau at some point in the future. How much have we got? Now this, uh, I'll, I'll predicate this by saying that this is the, uh, an optimistic prediction. But if the, this is the prediction of how much shale oil there could be from existing sources in the US, sources that have been discovered, and projections of undiscovered reserves. The United States, among all of these OPEC countries, becomes number one. 239, or no, 250 some billion barrels of potential oil. Permian all by itself is as big as Iraq. It, it, it's huge, it's huge, and, and they keep discovering more. They just keep discovering more down there. At the same time, technology, another point that we've been, I've been talking about, technology is making the break even point for profitability go down. Uh, in 2013, in the Bakken field in North Dakota, the production cost ha had to be um, $60 a barrel or less. Now it's down to $25 a barrel. Now you'll, you'll see different sources of data. This is production cost, which is different from sales cost. This is the actual comparative cost of a barrel of oil. For example, in the Permian Basin right now, your break-even cost, if oil is currently $46 a barrel, you're making money out of the Permian Basin. One more piece of data here. This has also had a big impact on our imports. Are we importing stuff now? Not really. These are data from the Energy Information Agency administration in Washington. Great source of information. The, and what I've done here is go back to the old, an old report, about 2005, and compared it to a new report that came out in 2015. And what you see here is this is the percentage of material, of petrochemicals, that we import. And we were crawling up and up and up and up and up here. You got here to about 2005, 2006. That's when switchgrass made it into the State of the Union message, which was great for renewables, folks. We were importing 61% of our finished products. And the projections from there were not good at all. These are the projections that you go out as far as you can. We're actually going to stay at that level or maybe go a little above. Fracking hits. This is the actual imports. 2015, it was predicted to be 27%. In 2015, we actually imported only 24%. And then you've got projections beyond that. This is just normal operating procedure, stays about the same. This is the pessimistic approach, but some of the optimistic approach has us by 2040, we don't import a thing. What to do with the biorefinery? We go back to our arguments, oh my gosh, we got a problem. Constantly increasing imports, no. New crude oil discoveries, yes, lots here. All of this fracking, we're, we're leading the world in many features. Ever dwindling supplies, nope. Raw material costs are going down. Imports from politically unstable countries, not really. 50% of our stuff comes from Canada and Mexico. Hmm. And it, well, okay. Canada still likes us. Um, <laughs> Mexico, I, I don't know, I don't know. That's, that's, that's a different discussion. Persian Gulf, all, all of OPEC, only about 27% of our imports right now. Whoops, sorry, I'm getting in. The other thing, the one that keeps coming back is greenhouse gas emissions. Again, that's another science forum discussion. The reality is that it's still applicable in the United States, even before the change in administration, it's a very hard sell. The, it's, 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 it's a, what, it will be a no-brainer in Europe. It's a very, very hard sell here in the United States. I'm not sure how you solve that. 
So is there any hope for the biorefinery? Yeah, there is. And it goes back again to, to uh, Carbon Petroleum Dubs and his family. That if you go from fuel only production and begin to integrate chemical production, you're going to start generating the profits necessary to make the biorefinery work. And here's just a cartoon of it. This is very analogous to the, the cartoon of the chemical industry that I showed you. You'll have all of these inputs, these renewable inputs that can come from farming, they can come from agriculture, they can, agriculture, they can come from forestry. They're all lignocellulosics. You can learn how to separate them and get to these individual components the same way you get kerosene, gasoline, jet fuel, all the materials out of petrochemicals, and then develop technology, have the technology follow an opportunity to generate a wide range of bio-based chemicals. Now, everything that's on here, all of these chemicals on here, one way or the other, have been demonstrated as, as uh, producible from biomass. And I'm, I'm happy to say that, it's, you know, I've written on this several times, and every time we do it, we're able to make this box bigger. Um, now, I, I don't want to run over here. Mark, how are we doing? You're doing fine. Okay, okay. Um, so, in any case, what, we're, what we hope to see is that the biorefinery will model the petrochemical refinery and continue to make fuels, high volumes of fuels, low value. You're not going to make money, you're not going to be profitable if all you make is fuels. But if you couple that with high value, lower volume chemicals, the integrated biorefinery, simultaneous production of chemicals and fuels, the economics work out pretty well. And you end up with a profitable way to make, uh, to, make uh, to, to, to displace petrochemicals that you might be using for, for the same application. I keep talking about economics. It's a reality. We do a lot of fundamental research in the CRC, but we're probably linked a little more closely to the real world than some of the, uh-oh, <laughs> some, some of the hard science departments. That at some point, because we're in the, bio, the business of biorefining, we have to be able to at least speak the dialect and describe how economically this is all going to fit together. Um, Industry is recognizing this too. I won't read all of these. This is just a, a laundry list of companies that are starting to look at high value chemicals and making them from biomass. And there's a, there's a lot of them up here. You get these bizarre names, but the one that I can, IKEA is on this list. IKEA is looking very strongly at incorporating some kind of renewable materials into the products that they make. Uh, so yeah, let's go on from here. Now, I want to give you one example to sort of wrap all of this up, how this, is, how this all fits together. I showed you the components that come out of biomass, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, and that big, nasty, hairy molecule lignin. Awful stuff. Um, but from a chemist's standpoint, if you're going to make chemicals, lignin is pretty attractive, and it's got a lot of things going for it. It's as much as 25% of the material that you can get in biomass, in lignocellulosic biomass. So there's a lot of it around. We've got methods to get it out of biomass, too. Those have already been demonstrated. So we can get isolated lignin. And it comes out as cheap. Get back to economics. If you have a large amount of a cheap feedstock, if you can develop technology to work with it, you've got a winner. The issue is, well, here the term is structural heterogeneity. That's just a description of how nasty that molecule is. There's nothing regular in its structure, which makes it difficult to throw some kind of a process at it that will break it apart in a way and allow us to reassemble it in some way that's better. But the promise is there. Lignin, as it turns out, I showed you on that chemistry slide, those aromatic chemicals that are key to the petrochemical industry. Lignin has aromatic units in it, and so it's reasonable to think that lignin might someday be a source of primary aromatic chemicals. Now you can do a, what the calculation you do, we're going to get in the weeds just a little bit here. The calculation you can do, you can look at how much of these aromatics are made by the petrochemical industry, and then do a calculation and determine, okay, if there's this much in the way of aromatics made, how much lignin do I need to make those aromatics? And so you make 60 million pounds of, uh, or 60 billion pounds of aromatics every year. That works out to about 114 billion pounds of lignin that you need. Okay, so what? Well, 
We're talking about lignocellulosix. If you're able to consume and convert 113, 114 billion pounds of lignin, the lignin initially came from a lignocellulosic that also has th three times as much sugar in it. And if all you do is convert that into fuel, you can make 25 billion gallons of ethanol. So there is your integrated system. By making a high value chemical out of the lignin, you can, make, you can also enable the production of a large amount of fuel and you have a model of an integrated biorefiner that will likely be profitable. So what do we know about lignin transformation right now? You can actually make lignin into a number of different things here. Now up at the top, these are just different kinds of transformations that, that, uh, that can be carried out in lignin. You can make high value chemicals out of it. You can make energy out of it. You, try and you can do thermal processes to it and make, so you've got this star diagram of all sorts of different chemicals you can make out of lignin. The issue is with this slide, it's from 1984. And the issue is that the technology for converting lignin is far behind what we need to be right now. You can go to the literature and look up different reviews and descriptions of what you can make lignin, what you can make into, or what you can convert lignin into. And the lists, even in very recent descriptions, are almost identical to that slide. Nobody's figured it out yet. Um, so the response from industry right now, all these industries that are making ethanol from lignocellulosics, they're just going to combust it. It's a, it's a critical waste of really nice renewable carbon. But the technology is not yet there yet. And I want to point out that this is an area that our group and the Center for Renewable Carbon is working in a lot. Uh, and we hope to someday be able to contribute to this in a, in a meaningful way. But again, another science forum. Now I'm going to wrap up here with just then some, some final thoughts. So at the beginning I asked, you know, can the, can the biorefinery survive cheap oil? Yeah, I think they can. But you have to be smart about it right now, especially when oil reserves appear to be going up, discoveries appear to be going up, and the fact that technology never stands still. The petrochemical industry will continue. That, why are the wellhead prices on, on fracking, on, on, on uh, shale oil dropping? Technology is getting better and better. They're learning how to make, they're not making mistakes anymore. But the key to this is to, again to take the model of the petrochemical refinery and do a parallel production of fuel and chemicals. That's going to give you the, the profits that will make this work. Um, and then something that we're working on right now, just want you to think, if, if you hear people talking about lignin, remember that yes, it's a difficult material to work with, but it might very well be one of the keys to making the, the, the petrochemical or the biorefinery work. So I'm going to bounce past a couple here real quick. And just want to acknowledge the, some of the great people I've had a chance to work with, uh, folks that have been paying for this. We've had a, a long-term uh, partnership with uh, C3 uh, that's led out of Purdue. Um, we've gotten some, the, the uh, ISSE right here on, uh, on campus has also uh, provided funding for this. And I want to thank the Fulbright Foundation. I was uh, lucky enough to be able to spend a semester in, in Belgium in 2015, which was uh, just a whole bunch of fun. And then, of course, all these fine people here that I've gotten to work with. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Questions for Dr. Purcell? Please. Question. Oh, the question is, there, you can, there's been work going on to improve photosynthesis. Um, is, there, or is there work going on to use, and then is there work in the biorefinery to use that, those improvements to make uh, biomass better or more effective? Is that, is that a good paraphrase? Yeah. Okay. The, the first answer is yes. People are working on improving photosynthesis. There's a lot of work on artificial photosynthesis. Sounds like you know some about, something about that already anyway. Um, there is, a, you know, our C3 bio is part of the ener an Energy Frontier Research Center. There is an entire Energy Frontier Research Center dedicated to understanding how to move these electrons around more effectively because it is an inefficient process. It's a question that's been asked and there's been a lot of effort over many years to try and do artificial photosynthesis and improve the, 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 the conversions. Okay. It has, it's, 
yeah, I mean, when photosynthesis is still photosynthesis, and we, we aren't, we, we don't have, but people are making like artificial leaves. And so are we able to get much more biomass as a result of that yet? No, not yet. I think a related issue, though, is if we go back to thinking about lignin, there is a lot of work on understanding how lignin is made in the plant. And there's a whole bunch of understanding about that. One of the things that we are able to do now is change the structure of lignin in the plant. Uh, I won't get into the details, but we can get actually very specific shapes of lignin and, 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 and uh, um, structures of lignin in the plant through genetic engineering. And so you think about that from an industrial standpoint. Right now, lignin is a terrible, awful molecule to try and convert. If you could do, through genetic engineering, generate a plant whose lignin was much more regular in structure and fell apart the way you liked or underwent a conversion the way you like, you've got a big leg up on using that additional 25% of, uh, of carbon. Now, I'm bi I, really, I'm re I really like lignin, so I'm biased towards that. But there are ways going on right now to adjust Maybe not the uh, very molecular level transformations, things like photosynthesis, but also to adjust the, the enzymatic processes that make the pieces and parts that go into biomass. Yes? How much arable land would you have to convert from what it is current use, which may be heavy, to land that will make the raw material lignin? That's that's a real loaded question <laughs> because one of the things yeah one of the things that you see uh, you check the literature on this it, it's gone in cycles everybody's excited oh we're going to use renewables to do this and that and everything well where are you going to get the land from and there's an entire issue on land use changes because if you're not growing corn anymore there might be some advantages to that corn uses a lot of fertilizer uses a lot of water and it's it, it's you have to plant it every year to do this on the other hand, you start planting something that is not corn. You're removing a food source. You're also changing how the soil responds. And there have been studies that have shown that if you take corn out of production and put something else in production, you actually end up with some more, more greenhouse gases than when you started. It takes a while for the soil and the environment to adapt to that. So to your question about how much, I. I would have to, that I'd have to refer you to our ag economics folks because you can either try and displace what you're using or you can go to what's called marginal land. Now the thing is, marginal land is called marginal land for a reason. <laughs> and so, you, <laughs> excuse pasture me, it, pasture or you know, rocks and weeds and nasty stuff. So there is quite a bit of available land that's not the high quality farmland. Now, to get into that part of it, it, it is an issue that we have to deal with. I don't have the hard numbers as to how much additional material you would need to do that. Now, I'm going to go on just a little bit here then. If you use corn, if you continue to grow corn, one of the uh, inputs, one of the lignocellulosic inputs is corn stover. That's the stubble that's left on the field after you harvest the corn grain. And a lot of the biorefinery effort right now is directed at going through the fields and taking that corn stover, which is, was normally left there to go back into the soil, and collecting a portion of it, and then using that as your non-food feedstock. So you kind of get a two for one. Well, on wheat, wheat straw be the same stuff. Wheat straw, yeah, absolutely. Wheat straw, flax, anything that has a straw, you know, a straw component that you normally don't harvest, yes, that would work. Um, this whole switchgrass thing that we were doing here in Tennessee over a few years, that was being put on land some, some farmers dedicated good land to it. We also did studies of, of marginal land that wasn't being used for, for production at that time. And switchgrass, switchgrass grows pretty well, about anywhere you put it. Sir? So, uh, fracking. Just yep. a quick back on pollution, possible earthquakes. What do you see as the, as the future of that? No, you guys are asking all the loaded questions here. No, what, what I see on that is that fracking is going to continue in the absence of legislation. Follow the money. Uh, right now you have a, a huge industry that is making profits they never thought they were going to be able to make before because all that oil that's been sitting in the ground has never been profitable to remove. You now have a technology to get it out. You have a huge existing infrastructure in the United States to consume that product. 
You've got the United States now being one of the world's leading exporters of oil and finished products. That hasn't happened in 40 years. And the price is, you know, $40 a barrel. So, I, so my answer to that is fracking is going to be here unless there is a, a legislative will to ban it. New York is nine years into a fracking ban. Uh, Ohio is running, into pro is running into problems with groundwater. Oklahoma has earthquakes. Oklahoma has earthquakes and there's, ain't nobody down there complaining about fracking. So it, it kind of gives you an idea of what the, the society's priorities. They complained about it or, or now. Yeah, they, I, I, the, the complaints from the local residents do not seem to be making it to, say, the Oklahoma legislature. But yeah, it's, it, those are all issues. Sir? Sort of the smarter uses of crude oil was plastics. I didn't even mention much about plastics. It seems like lignin would be a great item to do a structural material like this. We have a couple of the leading experts back here on making plastics out of lignin. Uh, you can convert lignin into a plastic itself. You can mix it with other plastics. You can, <coughs> excuse me, you can change its structure a little bit to make it a better plastic component. Absolutely, because plastics are the largest single segment of the chemical industry. So yeah, that, that's absolutely the case. Thank you so very, very much. Oh. And if other people have questions, maybe see Dr. Bozell just after. And thank you for oh, leading up our series so well. Thank you. Thank you.